Hello everyone and welcome back to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration and it's time for another update. In the last episode I was still talking about how I was wanting to get core mining up and running. And so what I've done here on um, back down, back this is back on Norvis, um, back, so I've, I've gone, come, come all the way back home again essentially, is I've got, I've, I've moved things around a little bit but basically kept, kept the same sort of general idea. So we've still got some core miners here digging up the, uh, the core chunks that are being then fed into this splitter and we're prioritising the ones that are being produced from these, from these drills as well. They're then being split out across all of these um, uh, pulverizers up here that are breaking it down into all of the different uh, sub ores as, as, as you're used to. So we, we've got it producing the um, vulcanite, copper, stone, iron ore and coal and very occasionally tiny tiny bits of uranium but only very very occasionally. <laughs> um, and I've, I've set this up so in theory I should be able to have full belts flowing, full blue belts flowing into here and then on the output we'll, we'll, we'll still have enough crushes up here to be able to deal with it all. Then we've got all of these splitters across the top here that are splitting it up into the various different um, the ores as you can see here to, to make sure they're all kept uh, they're all kept, they're set they're all separated out and after that they then get fed down here into the into the various stations and from these they can then be taken off to be um, reprocessed and used for for whatever it is we, we need them for. Now along here I've got um, I've set up the stations to have a higher priority than normal so we've got, we've, I've set it fairly arbitrarily to 4,000. So we're going to take the um, the, the, the ores and things from or stone or whatever from these stations first by preference before we start taking it from the other various mines that are around the around the base because they're the other mines are starting to run out a little bit but as you can see here there's um only uh, <laughs> only 700,000 coal left yeah okay so there's quite a lot there but we want to prioritize using what comes from the um from the mine from, from the uh, from the, the core mines instead because that is far cheaper I've also put in a second belt to carry the iron iron ore in here because when this thing's running flat out it's actually producing enough iron that this belt was starting to back up so I thought well I'll put a second one in. That now means that so if we look at the if we look at the process for, for dealing with um, core fragments as you can see you get the most iron out so that was the what that was why that was the first one that needs to be dealt with. But then copper, coal and stone are all quite similar amounts too. They're all five versus six. So I reckon it's not going to be very long until we start having the same problem with uh, with the copper and the and the stone and the coal as well. And so I'm going to possibly need to have even more of these belts running out from here. And that's going to be a bit, bit more awkward to fit in. Iron conveniently was the bottom one, so I was able to just run it down the outside of here and slip it in there. Um, copper, I suppose, yeah, the other ones I'm just going to have to bring down then jump over the uh, the belts here to get them in and get into the stations but that that's that's manageable I, I'll, I'll do that when as and when it becomes a problem at the moment as you can see there's there's far less um, of the ore going in than I'm actually the, the, sorry the core, core chunks going in that I can actually that I, than the system is capable of dealing with and that's because this this warehouse has run dry and this warehouse as you can probably tell by the clamp here is for spaceships to come and park next to so we've got the spaceship that comes from Miokin let's see if it's there at the moment it's very dark on Miokin at the moment, it's clearly night time. Okay, so it's not here either, but you can see here we've got the... No, hang on, that's the wrong one. Down here, here we go, here is the spaceship, it is here. So as you can see, it is um, loading up as the as the stuff come, as the Corsat fragments come through. And it's a bit of a slow process, because Miokin is quite a small planet, so even though I've got six uh, core mining drills here, they're not producing all that much stuff. I mean, if you remember on Norvis, I had four of them and they were producing a practically full blue belt. Here we've got six of them, and whilst that means they produce slightly less each, they should produce more in total. But because it's a smaller planet, or a smaller moon perhaps, they produce quite a lot less. That's then being split off, as we, as we discussed before, into the, um, the vulcanite and the core chunks and stone. The vulcanite is taken off to this station here. Shining my torture around like. Um, and then the other two are take brought off down here where they're passed into these um into these warehouses. And the idea being that in theory, if, if the spaceship takes long enough to fly there and back again, by the time it gets back, these will have filled up. But they don't actually fill up. They get to about fifty percent, two thirds full, something like that. Um, which is why this is only half full now, having drained this off completely, and then we've got a little bit of trickling through. So it's good this spaceship is gonna be waiting here for a while. But I don't think that matters. It just means I'll build up an additional spaceship for the other part of the for, the for the next part of the run or something like that. So yes, we've got the spaceship here filling up. Then it comes back to um, this is not Norvis. Then it comes back to Norvis, where it unloads in, into these warehouses, and 
at least when it's running when the system is running flat out this this does back up down here and this warehouse does fill up slightly more quickly than it empties and so that means that if i start bringing in multiple spaceships i think i should get to the point where there is a steady stream of, of core chunks being flowing out of here I, might look, I may need to look into unloading spaceships a bit more quickly, and I have some ideas about that, um, but at the moment this, this, will, this will have to do. So that was the first thing I did. Then I went back to Kalidus orbit, and here I've now put in even more of these um, solar panels. So we're now up to producing six, just over 6 gigawatts of power, which is a pretty crazy amount, but um, yeah, we, uh, that's, where, that's what we're doing. And we've now got two of these beam emitter things. This one, is still, this one I've now set to fire at Myokin. So it's, um, it's keeping Myokin powered. And as I start putting these receivers on more extra, extra uh, more different planets, I will be, I'll then start to be able to point this one at various different ones. Because if we have, if we have another look at Myokin, we'll see that the, uh, the amount of power here has, the amount of temp heat in this, in this beam receiver, well, it's got up to eight, eight and a half thousand degrees C. So they, they, they store an enormous amount of heat. So if you fire the beam at one of these for half an hour, and then transfer off to fire at a different one. You can keep multiple planets running with the same um, with the same beam transmitter. The downside is you have to do that manually. It's not something that can be done by um, through circuit conditions yet. But at least it's a that's at least that's a start. The other one of these, this one, you notice I've got three um, injectors on this one, whereas I've only got one here. So the way these things work, each of these things uses a gigawatt in presumably in sort of focusing the beam and keeping itself cool I don't know but each of these uses a gigawatt each of these then also uses a gigawatt but it pumps it into the uh, chamber and then out in the beam so if you don't have any of these you don't get any power you just use up some so this one is capable of sending one gigawatt this one is capable of sending three gigawatts for a total use power of four gigawatts um, and the, the, so this one is now firing at Norvis because I need a lot of power on Norvis and um, I might have mentioned this before, but I was getting quite worried about the amount of um, uranium I had left available. So I thought, let's make power in a different way. So up here, we've got one of these energy beam receivers, and that's, and that's got up to 3,200 degrees, and the temperature is slowly rising on it. And if we look over here, these are only just... At, yeah, these, these are only just above 500 degrees, but 500 is good enough. It means I can take in the water from all of these ranks of pumps across here, pass it through these... Um, these heat exchangers and produce and produce the steam that's coming out of these the, these turbines and this is as far as I can tell completely free energy once you've built up the infrastructure it is essentially a way of transmitting the solar power the solar energy from Kalidus orbit in the beam to to Norvis where I can now use this as a sort of uh, to, this it all gets hot and I can turn it into into heat now we're not getting a hundred percent of that energy through it's something like um, Let's see, if we click on these, it tells me how efficient they are. So we're getting a 64% transmission efficiency from here to Norvis. So the 3 gigawatts we're putting in, we're getting about 2 gigawatts out at the other end, presumably. And here we're getting about 71%, because Myokin presumably has a thinner atmosphere, or, or because it's closer, or something like that. Whatever reason, it's getting more of the energy is getting passed through anyway. So we, we, if, we, if we now go back to Norvis again and have a look at the power generation... We can see here we've got 1.8 gigawatts available in the current system, and we're using 1.1, 1.1, 1.2 of them. Um, but you'll notice that sometimes the power does spike up a bit higher than that. And on here we've got, yeah, we've got the um, the accumulators that can take the uh, can take the extra load for a short time. But what I've also done is I've, I've set up my all, all of my nuclear power plants that were over here before. They're all still they still all still exist, and they are running to an extent. So this one is presumably just trying to generate some steam. But you'll notice that all of these are turned off. I should probably have a look and find out why this is turned on. Um, ah. I've, um, yeah, messed up. Let's turn these back. Let's set these back to the way they should be. Um, so the idea is that these, will these, these nuclear reactors will only be running when they actually need, um, when, the, when the steam is actually needed. And because we're basically, and if you can, as you can see, they're basically all turned off now. All, all of the um, turbines are, are just simply not running. And that's because all the tanks are full of steam. And I've got this switch over here that is set up to um, to turn to, to open up when the power in this accumulator is above 80, I think it's 80%. 80 but if it's below, ever below it, if it ever drops below 60% or something like that, then the switch closes and we can then use the um, the massive the massive nuclear power plant to charge the accumulators back up again. So the idea is any sort of 
if there's any sort of blips in the power or if I end up using slightly more power than the solar thing is capable of producing then the nuclear will kick in and provide that extra bit of power however when it's not actually required when we don't when we don't need that any of the power from the nuclear plant all those reactors will be turned off and they'll stop using up all of my uranium now, let's see how did I set this up so this this is a flip-flop that I, I've, I've got set up um, in order to turn the power on and off at um, at different percentages so we don't get the sort of the flickering effect that you get if you have it turning on and off too quickly and the way that works is we've got these two um, combinators up here this one says uh, output a green if it's less than 60 to turn it on this one says output red if it's greater than 90 to turn it off then down here we have if green is greater than zero pass it pass that pass through one green and if this is and if this is, and it says if green green is greater than zero, then turn on, then um, then turn the switch on. So if we drop below 60%, we'll get a green from here. It'll be passed straight to here. This will go. Oh look, I've got a green. I'll pass it through to here, and uh, and and then the switch will turn on. <clears throat> we then have this uh, combinator, which says if red is zero, then pass through whatever you're getting on the input. So as long as, um, and then on the input side. We also feed, feed that green signal up to here. So if, as long as red is equal to zero, we'll feed that, that uh, green signal back through again, which means it'll go up to two. Then when power rises here, rises above the 60% here, that'll stop. But we'll still be getting the green signal from here, through here, and back down to here. So green will still be one, meaning this will be turned on. Once the power in here rises up to 90%, that will then trigger this one. The red will go will not be equals it to zero anymore. So this will then output nothing, and this and therefore there'll be no green on the input here, and that will turn the switch off again. So that's a basic. It's, it's a D-type flip-flop. It's essentially, but made in 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 the in the sort of the Factorio way, uh, and that it, it works as you can see. It's turned off at the moment. I, I tested it on on the on the stream. So if you want if you want to see, go back and uh, watch that stream, and it'll it'll show show you in there. Um, or if you prefer, you can you can take my word for it. Uh, so that con that controls the power and hopefully will re significantly reduce the amount of uranium we get through um, because I'm producing all the power from, from solar instead. You do need to have the switch in though, that, that's quite important. In, in, normal, um, in normal use you have this thing where uh, Factorio prioritizes different types of power in different ways. So it will use, um, let's make sure to try and get this right, it will use anything that comes from solar panels first, so any of the, any any power from here will be used first um, because it's free and the game is aware of that. Then anything that comes from steam will be used, so you'll use up, so that could be coal-fired power plants, it could be nuclear power plants, um, anything like that will be used because that's presumably effectively unlimited because you're bringing it all in as a supply and then if you run out of power on both of those then it'll start to discharge your accumulators so um, the idea is that it uses the cheapest and most abundant power first and then sort of moves its way down the chain the problem is that even though this where is it even though my beam power is even though this is technically solar as far as the game is concerned it's actually steam power because it comes from these um, comes from these turbines so that means it prioritizes it at exactly the same level as the nuclear power even though this one is technically kind of solar and so that means I need to put in the switch there to switch over between them if I was using actual solar panels then it would just it would just work and then I wouldn't need to worry about that but it, is, but it isn't <laughs> The other time that can be a bit of a problem is when you're producing, um, when you're processing vulcanite, because processing vulcanite produces quite a lot of steam at quite high temperature. So if we look down here, I've got these turbines here that take that steam and turn it into electricity and back into water as well, so I can recycle it because these are condensing turbines. Um, and on Miokin, that's quite valuable because um, you, you, water water is difficult to get here. I've, I've got it being brought in by spaceship at the moment, which is, I mean, it works perfectly well. I'm not going to knock it, but it is it is a, it, it is a limited resource. Um, in fact, these tanks are only these tanks are about 20, just over 20% full, so it's, it's kind of okay. We just need another spaceship to come along and drop some more off. But we're not processing the uh, vulcanite at the moment, so we're not getting through as much water. It's only up here that it's being used. 
Um, anyway, um, so what I was saying is yes, this is this is also this also counts as steam at exactly the same level. So if you've got a nuclear power plant or you've got a one of these beam power things, th these are, and these are going to be prioritised exactly the same level, um, meaning that you can't meaning that they they used to the same percentage level if they've both got a split supply of steam. So that that's why I've got four of them in here. I don't actually need for four of these turbines to get through the amount of steam that's being generated. However, because it's prioritised at the same level as all of these one of them wouldn't be enough because it wouldn't be prioritized high enough so um so i put in four and that's that that seems to be working so i'm not i'm not going to complain and there's a tank on the on the input to uh, just to store a bit of it and just make sure it doesn't overflow too quickly i wonder where that spaceship is because we've got full we've got a full box here of um a vulcanite and a whole 67 stone that's interesting I thought that's interesting because I thought that um, Vulca the vulcanite processing produced quite a bit more stone than that, but um, maybe not. Actually, looking at well, let's let's have a look. It's one stone for every eight washed vulcanite, and one washed vulcanite turns into four. Sorry, turns into one vulcanite block. So it's yeah, there should be eight times as much, but then plus a little bit more because of the productivity modules. We've got an extra 20% productivity there. So that should be about one um, one stone for every nine or ten um, vulcanite. I wonder where the rest of the stone is. That's very strange. Um, yeah, and it's on a postcard. If you know if if you know why there's so little stone here, oh maybe oh I know why it'll be. Yeah, the spaceship will have come down and landed here. And loaded up with all of the uh, the vulcanite straight out of here, um, and while that was loading in and refilling and so on, it will have it will have picked up all the stone from in here as well. Um, so that will have been completely emptied while that was stayed mostly full. Okay, that's why I understand now. <laughs> I've solved solved my own problem. But still, f please feel free to write something in the comments anyway. It's uh, it's supposed to be good for videos. <laughs> so those are the um, the main things I've done so far in this episode. I've um, I've got the beep power being beamed out a bit more, a bit more everywhere, -ly. Um and I've got uh, especially to here in order to take a bit of the strain off the off the uranium, and then down, I don't know, it's down here somewhere. Down here, I've got the um, this this flowing through a bit more, a bit more readily, should we say, a bit more, um, a bit more, a, a bit more. <laughs> I'm, I'm shipping, so I'm able to ship in the uh, the core the core fragments and then pass them through and get and turn them into turn them into all of the resources I need. Some extra work is required here, but that can that can wait. The next thing I want to do is I've been thinking about a bit, and, and I was alluding to a little bit earlier, is the biggest problem I've got now is this is the amount of time it takes to load and unload my spaceships. So the the spaceship will land here, great. It'll have 500 stacks of core fragments or vulcanite or whatever in it in, in, in a warehouse in it they get dumped onto a belt by the inserters in the spaceship and then they flow out into, into here um, in, in, into into this warehouse which is great except even blue belts are they only, they only transfer 45 items per second um, and that means to take 500 stacks which could be like 500,000 of something or 50,000 50, of something sorry um, it takes a while, 50,000, that's a thousand seconds, which is 15 minutes or so. That's quite a long t time to, to empty a spaceship. So what I'm sort of thinking I should probably do f uh, for my next next generation of this sort of thing is start putting trains into spaceships. So I can take my current basic design of spaceship. If we have a look in Norbis orbit, there's a fairly high chance there'll be one up here. <coughs> yeah, this sort of design of spaceship... I don't know why this is sitting here. Is it refueling? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, so th this is my uh, Vulcanite spaceship. It's parked here in Norbis orbit to get some more fuel in. So what I plan to do is to have essentially to remove all of the innards up up here and put all of the things like the booster tanks and the, the fuel tank and so on along the middle of the spaceship and the lasers clustered at the front of it in the middle as well, and then put. Uh, railway lines up here with with doors at the top and bottom and that way I can run trains into my spaceships and park the trains in them fly, fly spaceships around with, with with trains in them and the way I'm going to do this is I'll have a train that will um, I'll have a train 
in the spaceship and a train in wherever it goes to. So when the spaceship lands on Myokin, say, to pick up a load of Vulcanite, the, uh, the, the empty train in the spaceship will leave, uh, while the full train that's in the, waiting on, on Myokin will go into the spaceship. The train on, um, and then the train on Myokin can then pull into the station, fill up as much as as much as possible and then once the spaceship comes back again then it'll be ready to go around swing around and go back in again so that should mean that there's no waiting for inserters or belts or any of that sort of nonsense to happen you can just have a train you can have one train run out another train run in and then the spaceship can take off again immediately the biggest problem i can see with this is going to or the i mean that 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 will work that will make the uh the loading of the spaceships with the fuel loading loading and unloading the spaceship really really quick Loading of fuel, on the other hand, is still going to be a bit slow because, as you can see here, this is what, we've got this one pump chugging away here, and it's pumping like it's pumping quite slowly because this tank is basically full, <clears throat> and that causes it causes massive slowdown. I, mean, I could put, I suppose, I could put a pump there like that, and then a pipe that leads around into this tank, and that would that would help. I should probably do that. Um, but even 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 so, it's still the slowest part is going to be refueling them. So I might have to have a bit of a think about how to do that differently. The best way is probably going to be to switch over to using antimatter-powered starships. Um, that's going to be much, much better, but that's way out of my tech range at the moment. Whereas just putting, making this long, longer and thinner and putting trains in it, is perfect. I think is perfectly doable. So, as always, thank you for watching. I hope it's been an interesting episode, and um, I look forward to seeing you next time. Don't forget to come along to the streams on Tuesdays, and we also stream uh, Factorio Industrial Revolution on the Thursdays. That's with um, several, several of us playing that one. Um, and, of course, the GTA videos come out a couple of times a week as well, so that's all, all worth watching. As always, thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.